Uh, welcome to the information in evening about the Dutch summer school, or actually about the principles that we used to build uh, the program. So even if you don't plan to participate in our program, but you have a general interest in learning languages uh, or learning Dutch, then I hope you will receive some valuable insights from this lecture. And I want to mention specifically that I do not want to pretend that we have the best program on earth and that other schools do it uh, wrong. What I just want to discuss is what we have found out what works uh, best for a specific type of uh, students and why we do it differently in some way than other schools. So if you're thinking about participation, then maybe your task is to find out if this is something for you or maybe uh, not, that's also possible. Uh, for the people who do not yet know me, but I've kind of understood that most uh, know, but I'll quickly uh, introduce myself. Uh, I'm Bart, Bart Pau. Uh, I'm not a linguist, but I'm an engineer by education, but I have a deep love for learning uh, languages. One of the languages that I uh, learned, and I learned it actually by myself, is Russian. We already spoke some Russian uh, today. <laughs> Um, and because I knew that language, I was able to go to Russia to build a life, uh, start a business, to build a social circle, to buy a house, of course to get married. Um, and eventually I stayed in that country for more than 10 years, all because I was able to master the language because without that, it wouldn't have been longer than a few months. Like many foreigners that I saw there come and go. Now one of the projects that I did while living in Russia was establishing a language school. Uh, mainly for Dutch people who wanted to go on a language holiday, so to go to Russia, um, to book the accommodation and to have Russian lessons. And with the idea that huh, the students would not only learn the language, but also explore the country at the same time. And dur during those 10 years, or I should actually say uh, 17 years because I still run that school, I worked intensively with the teachers on continuously improving the program. And always being busy to find out what works best for our type of students in order to provide them with the maximum possible result in the short time they were with us. And also to give them, of course, a real fun uh, holiday. Now that experience, I took back to my home country and that's where the idea of the Dutch uh, summer school started. In other words, why wouldn't I not do the same in the Netherlands for the Dutch language as I had been doing since 2002 for the Russian language in Russia? So intensive Dutch courses with accommodation in an environment where the language is spoken. And in order to promote uh, the program, I started a YouTube channel and that uh, grew a bit more than I expected. It's now a uh, kind of a hobby that takes almost <laughs> most of my time. Um, and I have a website with a lot of free materials, as you may uh, already have uh, discovered. Um, I get a lot of mails every day, but one of the most frequently asked questions is, do you also have courses in, and then they mention their hometown. Or the question is, do you have evening courses? I have once per week, because I'm busy, and that's the time that I have available. And then, unfortunately, I have to say, uh, sorry, we, we don't have that. 
People say, ah, why not? Open a school in Rotterdam, open a school in Eindhoven, open a school in Utrecht. You have so many followers and, and, and great materials. You could earn a lot of money if you, earn, if you open schools in, in all those uh, cities. But the point is that I believe in something. And remember that I said that I'm an engineer. And what does an engineer? An engineer always thinks in how to do things in the best possible, most efficient way. And I consider that my uh, foundation. And that's the only way that I want to run the program. And besides that, this way it allows me to improve the program. Huh? Two months per year, I'm busy with the summer school, one month per year with the winter school, and so I have nine months per year to work on better and more materials. So, yeah, we do it a bit different than the language school in the hometown that has classes once per week in uh, the evening. And uh, this is what we're going to start to discuss today. And we're starting with the intensity, because that's a major uh, difference. And the Dutch summer school is basically full time. You have half a day of class and half a day of homework, so that makes a full day, and that for two weeks in a row, or four weeks, six weeks, or eight weeks, and per two-week session, 10 days in Amsterdam, nine days in Drenthe. If you compare that to how most language lessons in the Netherlands are offered, one time per week, then of course what, and the question is, what is more efficient? Who knows more at the end of the course? And I'm going to tell you about my experience in Russia, because there was a time that my school offered both type of courses. So the intensive classes and the once a week classes for expats living in Russia. We developed our own materials and we had blocks of 40 hours, 40 tuition hours. This is, by the way, exactly as how we do it in the, in the summer school, 40-hour blocks that correspond to a certain level and then you go to the next level, etc. So these blocks that we had in Russia, you could book as an intensive course, 40 hours within two weeks, or as a once a week course, also 40 hours, but a two hour session per week and then 20 weeks in total. And what did we find out? It appeared that by the end of the course, the people who had uh, the once a week course, they came on the average only to half of the book compared to the people who did the intensive course. And we are talking about the same amount of uh, tuition hours. So that's a significant difference. Now, in, in general, in education, there is a lot of debate about this, about whether you should learn continuously at a low intensity or whether you should learn intensively. And there are, are a lot of studies that show the difference in how people pass exams when a course is offered through the year or uh, as a crash course. And actually many summer schools at universities originated from that idea to do the same thing in a shorter, uh, more intensive period. Now, most studies show a slightly better result in terms of exam scores after intensive courses. Um, and that also counts if you measure, for example, one year after the course. There is some misconception that people think that when you learn fast, you forget fast. Uh, but that's not what those studies show. But these studies, they were done uh, mostly in environments where everybody comes to class and is obliged to do the homework, so high schools and universities. So there is a positive difference on intensive learning versus continuous learning. 
But I think actually that the reason our expats in Russia came to only half of the book compared to the people who went for an intensive course is a different reason. It's actually a combination of practical reasons. Now imagine if you have class at the end of the day, after a busy day at work. That's different than when the class is your only activity during that day. After a busy day of work, you're not going to be as fresh in class and you will not absorb as much information. If you are having classes next to the hassle of your daily life, it might happen that you, you need to skip a class once in a while because there is this project that you need to finish at work or there is this important football match that uh, you don't want to miss. And the same counts also for the homework. Yeah? Even though uh, you have a whole week to do the homework, what we saw is that the people who have an intensive course and who have only one evening to do the homework, they do the homework more than the people who have the whole week available. It's what we find out. And both for attendance as for doing the homework counts that, let's say you are the one who does the homework and who always come to class. The point is you're in a group and not every group member uh, might have the same uh, attitude and as a result the pace of the group can slow down. And there is one more reason Imagine that you're in class um, and you, hi, you come in, you come for the lecture? Yeah. Okay, have a seat. Thanks. We already started uh, without you, yes, but uh, <laughs> no problem. Um, so there is an, uh, another reason uh, in intensive courses. Um, now imagine that uh, the previous thing that was explained, it was one week ago. Um, it's more likely that during the lesson of today, you need some time for repetition because it was a week ago. Especially if you compare that if the previous lesson was yesterday. So what we saw in the once per week lessons is that the time used during the lesson for repetition and for reviewing was much higher than during the intensive course where we could easily, more easily go to the next uh, subject. And it's actually all about focus. When you have hundreds of things going on in your personal life and language learning is just one of them, probably not having the highest priority of all the members in the classroom that's a total difference uh, compared to when you are 100% focused on learning. Or actually everybody in the group is 100% focused on learning. So intensity is actually also focus. But I would like to add something and that has to do with the progress of someone who enters the Netherlands to live here. In language learning, there is a, uh, a point that you start to understand what's going on around you. And you start to use that language. And that's approximately the A2 level. Once you have that level, the practice in your daily life is going to increase your uh, Dutch skills outside the classroom. Now, have a look at this graph. So we see... Uh, level and time, very simple graph. Let's say you do an intensive course of four weeks or six weeks, you are progressing a lot in the beginning. Yeah? That could bring you to level A2. And because you have interaction afterwards, you can further increase that level just by not having classes, but by, by using it in real life. Now compare that, that at the same moment that the person enters the Netherlands but subscribes for a one week, a one time per week uh, evening course and that actually brings, to the, brings you to the same level but over a longer period of time then 
by the end of the year, you're going to be here. So you have the same amount of tuition hours. You have much more benefit from it if you start with learning the language. Um, of course, this is only applicable if you live in a, a Dutch-speaking environment and interact with that environment. And especially the people who have a Dutch partner uh, who comes to the Netherlands, uh, this is what I recommend as uh, the path to take because you have actually the opportunity after the course to directly switch to Dutch with your partner, which is something that you definitely should do. Like I have a Russian wife. My wife was mainly on A2 level when we start talking in Dutch with each other and after that she progressed so much. It's a little awkward in the beginning because you're used to communicate in another language but if you do it after one week it's not awkward anymore and, uh, and, and that will definitely help. Okay, we've spoken about intensity uh, so far um, but there is one more way that our courses uh, are different or there's more Accommodation, this has actually uh, the same principle. We just discussed that when you have only one thing to do, you're fully uh, focused. Now, when I'm writing lessons for hashtag Dutch grammar or for the Happy uh, soap opera that I have on my YouTube channel, I simply cannot do that at home. Um, it's a process that requires my full attention and every phone call, every time my wife or my daughter walks in, all the stuff on my desk and all the things that I have to do normally at home, it distracts. And of course, I, I could tell my wife and my daughter not to disturb me. I could clean my uh, desk. I could skip some of the things for a few days, uh, but actually found out that for me, there's one thing that is much more effective, simply to escape. So, uh, leaving everything behind, go to a quiet place, switch off the phone, and being fully focused on writing the uh, materials. And I do that by booking a hotel in some forest for a few days, and I write, write, and write. And I really believe that when you leave everything behind, you increase the focus and you increase the results. Now we offer accommodation on both our locations, in Drenthe and uh, in Amsterdam. But in Drenthe, almost everybody books accommodation. In Amsterdam, it's about half of the students because uh, some people live in Amsterdam or uh, the city is close by and they commute to the, to the lessons. The question is, is booking accommodation more effective? Well, that depends uh, on the type of person you are. Um, and of course, it uh, depends on the things that you have at home. For some people, it will be more convenient to sleep in their own bed or to have their Dutch-speaking partners uh, or family next to them so who, who could help with the homework. Um, some people are good multitaskers and they can perfectly combine their daily life with an intensive course, but for others like me, um, we will benefit more from the focus. It happens quite regularly that we see students in Amsterdam who have a busy life next to the course and at some point they cannot keep up with the pace because they have too much things going on at home. This is an interesting thing. Some of our students live in Amsterdam and therefore they book a course in Amsterdam. Some students live in Amsterdam and therefore they book a course in Drenthe. It's a different way of looking at it. It all has to do with focus. But not only that, um, booking accommodation and living together with other students, people who are like-minded and have the same goal as you, it has more benefits. And that's the next difference. The social atmosphere. And here I must explain that there is a difference between Amsterdam and Drenthe. 
Because in this respect, our school in Amsterdam is much more like a regular school. And by that, I mean that people come to the school, follow the lessons, and then everybody goes home and does the homework. In Drenthe, 95% books, of course, with accommodation. And the accommodation itself already forces to be social. It's just too difficult to retreat in your own room. And what we see is that outside the lessons, people spend a lot of time together, including making homework together, uh, cooking together, exploring the environment together, and practicing speaking Dutch together. In Amsterdam, there is a lot to do, and the people who book accommodation in Amsterdam, they have their own interests. For one, that's going to the museums. For another, that could be partying. Maybe someone would go to the coffee shop. Um, but everybody has its own reason to go to Amsterdam. And the accommodation that we have in Amsterdam has a lot of privacy, which is a good thing on the one hand. But what we don't see is as much interaction between the students if we compare that to Drenthe, which really is like a camp for adults in the middle of nowhere, so you just have to spend time together. Um, if people become friends outside the classroom, that's not only good for doing homework together or trying to practice speaking Dutch with each other, it has its effect on the lessons too. One of the major obstacles that people have when learning, is du when learning Dutch is that they are afraid to speak. But when the people around you in class become friends, that lifts a certain barrier, and that makes it so much easier. We had people who said, well, I actually oh, I already know everything. Um, but the most important thing that I get from the course is the self-confidence to speak because I felt so comfortable with these people around me. Um, what we, oh, that was the, the thing. What we actually uh, experienced during the course, um, especially when people uh, live together, is that all barriers are lifted. When people have a common goal, it doesn't matter what is the background, the age, the nationality, gender, religion. People get along very well. We once had a girl from Brazil, 16 years old, and before registering, her father was really interested to know if there would be students uh, of the same age. And guess what? She became friends with the oldest participant in the course, uh, a 71 year old lady from the US and they were all the time together. And two years ago we had a girl from Israel and before she registered her boyfriend called me and he said that she was a bit worried if there would be Arab people. And I said well in the first place if you do this course you should be open to any other student and it's totally irrelevant if someone is from an Arab country or, or not. So okay, the girl registered, she came to the course, and on day three, we had a karaoke evening, Dutch karaoke, singing songs together. And when it was her turn, she grabbed the microphone, and she said, the only Arab guy that we had in the room was invited, was the lucky one to dance and sing with her. So that makes me sometimes really happy when I see that, knowing the story of the earlier call uh, when she was worried. Now, I don't say that it's a necessary condition to have a nice time outside the lessons, but it definitely helps the process. And there are really friendships born. St students get to know each other, um, and when the course is over, uh, continue to meet each other. And I'm a human being as well, so I also become friends with people who participate in the course. And for example, next month I will go to Poland for a wedding because a student with whom I became friends is getting married. 
The social atmosphere that we have, especially in Drenthe, is for many people, I think, the reason to come back to our course. The highest level that we offer consists almost only of people who already visited us before. And apart from learning the language, I think that for them the reason is the reason to participate is to have a good time with nice people uh, around. And why do I think that? Well, our program in, Am in, in Amsterdam and Drenthe are basically the same. But the return rates, the amount of students that come back in Drenthe is much higher. And I think that's because of the social element. It's more than just learning uh, the language. But it brings me to the next thing, because that's anyway important in language learning. As long as something is fun, you will keep going on. And fun is more than having nice people in the classroom. It's the materials, it's the teacher, it's the environment. It's the satisfaction that you get from progressing. It's humor um, and mainly as much as possible not feeling that you need to study. Eh? There are elements, there have to be elements during the lesson, during the homework, that make it fun. Of course, this is something that a good teacher knows, and for sure, not only at the Dutch summer school, uh, you can find lessons that are fun, but we do pay a lot of extra attention to that. Uh, to, we try to keep our lessons interactive with role plays, a lot of fun materials, games, and we evaluate also how things worked out in the lesson. But also the materials itself. Uh, we developed uh, is anyone watching the Happy Zin videos? Not yet. So have we developed our own soap opera um, for learning Dutch? Uh, these videos, by the way, they also integrate with the lessons and they're part of the, of the homework during the summer school. Uh, and as it is a soap opera, I try to build a bit suspense uh, to find out if uh, Martin and Marike will finally come together. And I know there are even Dutch people watching it simply because they want to know how it will end. Um, but that brings us to another thing in which I think we are a bit different. Um, we developed our own uh, materials, not only the videos, but also the book that I have here and that we use. Um, and this is not a, a general book, as for example, uh, this one that we used in the, in the first year, maybe you, you've seen that many l other language schools use that. Um, we really can do our own thing with our own materials without the need to please everybody and to be 200% politically correct. Um, I would say our materials are a little bit more spicy, more juicy, uh, which for most people, especially as they're in the holiday mood, is just uh, fun. And additionally, I had the advantage of having your own materials is also that we can cover specific situations any summer school student will uh, experience during their stay because that maximizes the chance that students can actually use it in real life. And what I mean to say is that, uh, for example, the situations at the reception of the student residence uh, the bike rent, the shopping for the barbecue, the boat trip in Amsterdam is all part of the materials, but it's also what people in real life experience during the summer school. And so the students can practice what they've learned. And of course, we designed the, uh, the materials specifically for an intensive course of four hours per day with three to four hours of homework um, and with the two week blocks that I just talked about. Our lessons contain what one person can comprehend on a day and as we know from the feedback of our students for 90% of the students that is the right pace. But it's more than a book and videos. 
Yeah, don't. You can you can always use the, the online materials. I'm I'm now coming gradually to the point where I explain what is what we do during the summer school and what is like additional to the to the materials. Um, but first, a bit about the teachers. It's more than just a book and videos. In the first two years of the of the summer school. We didn't have our own book yet, and we worked with Nederlands en Gang, this, this, uh, this book. Afterwards, we asked the students for feedback on a lot of uh, criteria. At that time, I had given the teachers a lot of freedom in how they used the book, um, as long as they covered a number, an agreed number of chapters. But one remarkable thing from the feedback was that the teachers who used PowerPoint, they scored significantly better than the teachers who didn't. And yeah, of course, if a teacher uses PowerPoint, that's a sign that they are prepared well. But I saw t some teachers who, uh, I saw that teachers who prepared less, but used PowerPoint more, scored better than teachers who prepared a lot but didn't use PowerPoint. Um, the feedback of the, the students about those teachers, so who prepared a lot but didn't use PowerPoint, was that they, they seemed a bit unorganized. That was the, the perception, the, the impression. And I knew it was not true because I, I was there when the teachers were preparing for four hours uh, the lesson for the next day and I knew the whole structure, but apparently the PowerPoint added a clear, visible structure to the lessons. And the importance of a clear structure, that was something that I had experienced in my time in Russia in the beginning uh, as well. Russian teachers, especially the elder ones with a Soviet style, uh, they tended to work like this, like the students walked into the classroom, they started to talk about what the students did the day before, and as the students started talking and they made a mistake, the teacher would explain why it was incorrect and explain why it, uh, how it should be. A, a bit a random approach of choosing the topic of the lessons. And I noticed that for my Dutch clients, huh, we're now talking about my Russia time, that was a no-go. Uh, a Dutch person is used to structure, so uh, it was one of the first things that I worked with my teachers in Russia to have a clear plan for everybody at the beginning of the course uh, and at the beginning of the lesson and continuously show where on the road we are. Like in this presentation, we're now here. <laughs> um, so what we did at the summer school, um, in the third year, we developed PowerPoints for every lesson and for every teacher in order not to be dependent on how enthusiastic the teachers were, just PowerPoints for everybody. And we started to combine best practices. You have to know that normally Dutch language teachers, they are a bit uh, lonely in their profession. During the year they work for a school and of course they meet a lot of students, but usually they don't meet so often with other teachers. So everybody does it a bit in his own way. And I feel that here uh, we make a difference because in Drenthe, the teachers that I have, they are not from Drenthe, they don't go home in the evening. Now, they also live at the student residence for eight weeks together. Uh, so outside the class, they spend a lot of time together, or actually I should sp say we spend a lot of time together because I'm also uh, usually there, and we're having lots of conversations about exercises that we tried in class, about experiences, when something worked and when something didn't work, and all that brainstorming and giving each other feedback that helps not only the team to get better, 
but it also becomes part of the materials. And so we use that in Amsterdam as well. And sometimes outside the course periods, we would come together, for example, last week, last year, uh, I organized a creator week with all the teachers. And then we worked in a team on creating uh, new materials, all the time being together. So the materials became better over the years because of the interaction between the teachers. And it contributed to the fact that I think I'm very blessed with a team of really good teachers who want to work during the summer as much as possible. In the first year, I heard may mainly, oh yeah, maybe I can teach two weeks. Um, but not this time. I've, all my teachers want almost to work uh, the full eight weeks. At the same time where other schools have sometimes difficulties in finding uh, good teachers. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. But I think it's something that we built uh, together. Now let's go back to the materials. And that brings us and actually to your question. Um, the blended learning. That's, um, I'll explain. And maybe you remember from school how a teacher is explaining things by writing something on the whiteboard. You would copy that in your notebook. And at the end of the lesson, the teacher gave the homework, which was basically learning the notes from the notebook and doing exercises to practice. That is not how we do it. Um, first about explaining. A lot of people, they have the, the perception that only a real person can explain something. Um, but now think of the following. On the one hand, we have the classroom teacher who probably spent a few hours the evening before to prepare the four-hour lesson of the next day. On the other hand, in every 10-minute video, we put 20 hours of work. We thought very well of how to explain it, with which words, which, which examples, in which order. Uh, we made sure that we tell what is needed and we don't tell what would be considered overload of information. Multiple people were involved correcting each other, uh, giving ideas, other teachers, proofreaders. And we use animation to make things even more clear on the screen. So yeah. From what do you learn more? Of course, the 10-minute video teaches more and in a more efficient way. And that's what people tell sometimes after the course. They say, oh, I'm actually surprised. I, I learned so much from the videos, actually, more than, than from the real uh, classroom. That's logical, because it's a result of the effort that we put into it. Now, what we don't do is uh, putting people in a classroom and pushing the, the play button. Yeah, that, that would be... Now, we're, by moving the instruction to the videos and giving the videos as the homework, we can do in class those things where the teacher really adds maximum value, and that is interaction. A language is not only about knowledge, it's a skill. You can watch a video, understand what is explained in the video, but it's all about practicing, converting the passive knowledge of the theory into actual sentences. It's the difference between building a sentence and thinking 10, 20 seconds about every word and actually saying something quickly. It's the difference between choosing the right answer from a multiple choice question to being able to generate the answer yourself. Passive knowledge, active skills. So that's what we do in the classroom, working on the active skills. This whole principle is called flipping the classroom. Our homework is not doing the exercise after the lesson, no, you watch the video, the videos, before the lesson in the classroom. 
You learn the vocabulary before the lesson in the classroom. So that in the classroom, we can practice making sentences with the grammar and the words that we just learned. And so you prepare at home the vocabulary. These are the, the lists in the book at the beginning of every chapter. The grammar, that's the videos, the hashtag Dutch uh, grammar videos that you can also do as a, as a self-study course. And the vocabulary and the grammar combined are the happy as in videos that you need to watch as the as the homework, but you can also watch them online. They're free anyway, so. Um, but if you come with this preparation to class, then you can really do something. And about grammar, I want to say uh, something extra. Oh, it's not working anymore. Oh. Okay. Um, I'm going to say what, what is on the screen. Here should be grammar now. Uh, not all language schools, not all books include grammar in their instruction, or at least not to the extent that we think is necessary. For example, Nederlands in Gang, this book, is quite limited in offering, offering grammar. But it's still a lot better than a lot of American self-study programs like Rosetta Stone, Pimsleur, Duolingo, where there is almost no grammar at all. And about the importance of learning grammar, which is the structure of the language, um, I have another lecture, which you can find on my uh, YouTube channel. Just very sh short, what I ex explain in that lecture is that if you learn a language as an adult, you can only learn it fast if you have a balanced method where grammar is the foundation. There is no other way, there is no special trick that lets you learn like a child, what they sometimes pretend to say, uh, or to learn without efforts, or to learn while you're sleeping, That's, uh, that doesn't work. Um, if you're not convinced, you should watch that, uh, that lecture. Now, next thing, instruction language. So, if you instruct something to someone, what is most important? That the person to whom you instruct understands it. That's the most important thing. But that also means that it has no sense to speak only in Dutch when it comes to explaining grammar or giving other instructions. Specifically for that goal, it is better to understand something than to have exposure to the target language, the language you're learning. There are studies that have shown that in order to fully understand the explanation of grammar rules, someone should have at least B2 level, which is actually the level on which you already should know everything. Okay? So it makes no sense to teach grammar in the language you're learning. Now, our program is, is for people who know English because we use English as the instruction language. There are a lot of schools that use only Dutch. And it's logical because a main part of the market are people who did not have English in class at school. So there is no common language that everybody masters, and then you cannot use an instruction language. But what we hear a lot, because people sometimes switch to first school and then come to us, is that um, people, if, if the, the lesson is entirely in Dutch, then they're sometimes feeling lost when they really cannot understand what, what it is about. Now, what level should you have to do the summer school? Well, at least B1. It should not be perfect. Our own English, as you can hear, is also not perfect, probably. No, it's already a lot of mistakes. There was no proof, proofreader uh, checking this text. Um, uh, the teachers will use pretty simple 
uh, language, but understanding is important. But it does not mean that we speak only English in class. Uh, English is mainly used in the instruction, and the main part of the instruction is in the homework, the videos to watch to the homework. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, but uh, as, as far as it's not instruction, then of course the teacher will uh, speak Dutch. The use of English in class will be more at the beginner level and grows gradually down to um, at our level four, which is the A to B1 level, teachers don't speak English anymore. You have in the homework uh, English in the grammar videos, but for the rest, no English. One question. How many levels do they are? Um, at the end, I'm going to explain. Okay. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, then, th this is the, the group of people that, um, that, that, that come to our classes. When I started the program, I did not really have an idea uh, to focus on a specific group of Dutch learners, mainly because my language school in Russia had uh, people with all, with all levels of education. But that was not a summer school. And here, in the first year, we already found out the following, that most people who do something like this in summer, that are the type of people that choose learning a language above lying on the beach. Wait, you could maybe do it both at the same time, but um, it's usually the people who are higher educated who come to our, uh, our school, and that means that we adjusted the pace of learning to this group. It's not a condition, but the, the pace is challenging. Um, so our method is optimized for people with a higher education, uh, and this is, by the way, also the group uh, for which an approach in English uh, as the instruction language and with a good grammar foundation uh, works the best. Now, the next thing is incentive. Um, a difference with a lot of language school is that uh, we really focus on the people who have, by themselves, a strong incentive, a strong personal motivation to learn the language. In many schools, the student is not always the one who paid for the course. Uh, there could be a third party that has a high interest that the students learns Dutch. It could be the employer, the university, uh, the government that gives out subsidies, um, city administration that sponsors certain programs. And there are a lot of people who are learning the language because they, they need to pass the exam in order to stay in the Netherlands. And although we, we do have people whose company paid, although we do have the students who are in the process of getting a passport or getting the, the residence permit, uh, the people who do our course they really want to learn the language anyway. It's not because they're forced to, and it's not because it's maybe free or cheap. Um, most people, and I see that on the billing uh, details, they, uh, they pay themselves for the course. It's around 95% of the people who do uh, the course with us. So that means that, that most people have such a high motivation that they're uh, to learn the language that they're willing to pay for it themselves. And having such a high motivation, that is an, yeah, that's an, an, a success factor uh, by itself. And when everybody in class is so motivated and really wants to learn the language, this also means that this is incorporated in our way of teaching. And we will not check if everybody did the homework, we just expect that. Right? We're not in a high school, we don't uh, punish. Um, I mean, it's the, the money of the student and therefore it's the, uh, the incentive to, to learn. Uh, and by the way, by the, the structure of the, the, the principle of the flipped classroom, automatically, if you don't do the homework, yeah, it has no sense to come to class because then you're not prepared. 
for people, now I'm looking to uh, Mark, was it? Yeah, <laughs> right. um, it also counts for uh, people who have parents who want to ch send their children or couples where the Dutch person want to send his or her partner. Um, I always ask, so I'm now going to ask again, who came with the idea? Um, <laughs> I would say both, but um, she was searching for, for classes, but yeah. Okay. Uh, so she sent me a couple of links and then we put it together. Okay, that's good. Yeah. That's good, because that's what I always ask. If, if the, had the, the student found this and wants to do this, then it's, then it's good, but uh, sometimes I have a parent on the phone who clearly needs to convince uh, the child to, to do this. That, that's, that's not going to work. Um, now, coming back to the inburgering, uh, because the question might rise, huh? Sh should I yeah, do this course if I'm in the process of, of inburgering? As I already said, we have a lot of people who do this course and they're also in the process of preparing to pass the exam. There are two important things that I want to say. Like, if you're just interested in passing this exam and not so much in speaking Dutch afterwards, then there are schools that are fully focused on passing the exam. So you learn only what you need to know for the exam, and if that is your goal, that's better than coming to our school because we have a more general approach um, and we might teach something that is not part of the, uh, the, the stuff you need to know for the, for the exam. And the secondly, secondly, what we teach is only the language. And for the Inburgerings exam, there are other things that you need to, to know, uh, the orientation on the labor market and the knowledge on the Dutch uh, society. We don't do that. You can perfectly do the language uh, at our school and the rest something somewhere else, but, but at least we, uh, you should know that those things you also need to pass. Now, to conclude, there are a few other things that are a result of what we discussed before. First of all, all the, the materials that we uh, developed they are also helpful when it comes to preparing for a certain level. So let's say your level is now somewhere between zero and A1. And there's no need to subscribe for the, for the, the beginner level uh, because you can prepare with our materials to, to get to our level two uh, by just doing the hashtag Dutch grammar course, for example. Um, and the online materials, they really help also on the higher levels to make sure that everybody who starts the course has the required prior uh, knowledge. Uh, another thing, and that's, that's a positive side effect of the principle of the flipped classroom, is that in case you miss a lesson, but you're able to do all the homework, then you are not behind on the things that you should know. Okay? Because most of the instruction is in the homework. Of course, yes, you miss the chance to practice in class when you're ill or you have something else to do on, on a specific day. But you can at least continue with your course without problems. Uh, and that would be different if the instructions were all in the, in the classroom. Um, I started my lecture with the difference between intensive learning and, and continuous learning, and I think that uh, all the online materials that we have, they provide a foundation to continue learning after the course, after an intensive course, and to review what you have learned during the intensive course, and to continue to build further upon that. And once you're in this, this method and, and know the structure of all the videos, you can easily work yourself through, uh, through the materials and perhaps until a next, uh, a next course where you can make another uh, jump again. And it's actually the way a lot of our re returning students do it. Eh? We have plenty of students who started once at zero level, uh, did an intensive course, then used the materials to go 
uh, further, and then again they come back and do an intensive course. And there are people who already, f since I started, they, they, they come to all the, the summer and winter schools that we have. Um, there's one last thing that I need to say. I, I think here in the room, maybe everybody, it's obvious, but remember that I started my Russian courses with the idea of learning the language in an environment where the language is spoken. Um, well, that's important when you choose between Amsterdam and Drenthe. Uh, Amsterdam is absolutely a great city, uh, but if you're looking for a course in a Dutch-speaking environment, where people will not switch to English, English once they hear you're a foreigner, or where they anyway do not speak Dutch at all, like many people working in Amsterdam, um, then you better go to, to Drenthe, eh, where people are not so much in a rush, where people have the time to listen to you, where people understand that you are learning the language and want to practice your Dutch and actually feel proud that you, you do so. It's a difference between Amsterdam and Drenthe. Well, these were the, the differences I wanted to show, but yeah, it's, it's stuck. Uh, the differences that um, I think is different at the Dutch summer school uh, compared to the language school that has classes once a week in the evening. Um, we always try to improve. Um, I hope that what I told you is, is, is uh, something that can help you make the judgment whether this is something for you, uh, whether maybe uh, you don't need the school but you can perfectly do with the, um, with the online materials if you have a lot of chance to practice because that's basically uh, what is very important. Um, I told you at the beginning that I learned Russian actually without taking classes. I studied a lot, I did the, the grammar, I learned it from books, uh, and I learned it while practicing a lot, and I didn't need uh, a teacher to explain things, uh, things to me. Uh, that doesn't mean that for a lot of people, going to a school, having interaction with teacher, with other students, having the, the pressure to really, uh, yeah, you need to do it, otherwise you're, uh, you're gone, that's for really a lot of people is very, very helpful to be fully uh, focused. There was a few times during the presentation that I referred to scientific research, but I didn't want to discuss that in detail because it's already a very long uh, presentation. If you're interested, uh, send me a mail and I can send you the links to those studies where things were uh, proven. It's just that I don't want to, to have a story without sources claiming uh, all kind of things. Um, thank you well. Thank, thank you very much for uh, your attention.